गुड मॉर्निंग हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द सेशन इन टूडे सेशन वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट फ्लोटिंग पॉइंट नंबर रिप्रेजेंटेशन एंड एरर डिटेक्शन एंड करेक्शन को आई एम अक्षय कुमार एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर and this session is primarily for mca bca and pg dca students of igno first year students but other students can also watch the session as usual let's start this particular session with a piece of advice last time in the last session i requested you to download the program guide now i request you to please go through it also because still i am re receiving queries of the similar nature go through that particular program guide you will find help for most of the topic which you want to ask us and the first good help for any student is him or herself so that help should be utilized okay so i think with this we start this particular session today's discussion and uh, we move uh, the reference material for this particular uh, session is going to be block 1 unit 2 of mcs 12 and you can refer to this particular block very easily uh, there are slight changes in the slides which have been uploaded and the presentation and you can uh, find those differences while we are making the presentations so there are some unintentional errors and some intentional errors in that particular presentation so let's uh, start about the floating point numbers now many a times we worry about floating point Now, what is a floating point? What does it mean? A floating point representation, right? So, I just want to uh, look into a floating point representation first. But I must know what a floating point number means. Okay. Now, in order to understand floating point numbers, let's look into the real numbers which we normally use. Okay. And the real numbers are something like, for example, twenty-three point five. and if we represent that particular number in uh, scientific notation then it can be 2.35 into 10 to the power 1 like like that i can represent the numbers either in scientific notation the uh, real numbers in scientific notation floating point representation is a direct replica of scientific notation which we use in chandra okay and it consists of as you can see in the slide two parts which is sign fixed point number which happens to be the mantissa and the binary point position why we call it floating point because the point position is not fixed suppose one number is 22.5 another can be 2.25 right another can be 2.35 2.29.75 like that the point position is varying and that is what is the floating point now when we are representing these numbers using computers the mantissa can be either integer or a fraction that is as simple as that now the position now what you really need to understand that the position of binary point is assumed and it is not a physical point this is what you need to understand that this is not a physical point it is just an assumed situation okay and now most of the time we assume when we are representing floating point number the position of binary before the number and that makes it the uh, that is the point number right so decimal number it, it this is what it is let's look it in uh, look this with the help of an example suppose there is a decimal number 67.94 now we want to represent it in the mantissa and exponent form okay now easily i can represent mantissa as fraction and exponent as decimal okay so this is how i can easily represent it so what is going to be my uh, now this has to be a fraction so how it, this fraction will look like fraction will look like 0.6794 and that is what it is represented over here so 6794 okay what is the value of sign sign happens to be plus and plus happens to be zero so 0.6794 
exponent happens to be the exponent side is going to be plus okay because the number is going to be point 0.06794 into 10 to the power plus 2 so exponent is going to be point uh, that is 0 2 and the sign happens to be 0 now exponent is just a number right it is not fraction okay it's a integer form okay so mantissa if ha if we represent the same number using an integer mantissa then the number is going to be once again 6794 but look into the value of the exponent if i want to represent it and uh, this this particular number actually it is once again you can see the mistake over here the number should be 6794 into 10 to the power minus 2 not 0 0.6794 6794 0.0 into 10 to the power minus 2 and the exponent therefore has to be 1 followed by 0 2 now that's a very very complex representation if we talk about computer system isn't it because in computer system this is going to become very very difficult algorithm to solve this kind of a situation so what do we do let's look at this with the help of another example so suppose the number is this time decimal number is 10.25 so we are we want to represent this number with the help of binary floating point representation so the equivalent binary value is going to be if i say 10 it is going to be 1010 0, 0, that you can uh, calculate and 0.25 will is going to be 0 0.01 so the number is now 1010.01 and in, in binary we will be representing we will always be representing the mantissa as a fraction so what the equivalent value of this particular number is going to be 0 0.101001 into 2 to the power 4 that is 4 is equivalent to 00, 0. in fact it should be once again second mistake it should be 100 0, 0. Okay, this has been corrected over here. So that is what you can see. So floating point numbers are represented in normalized form. Fractional mantissa does not contain zero as the most significant digit of the number. So now this uh, normalization is another concept. So we have represented this particular stuff. But when we want to represent floating point number, now this 0 0.1000 this number we can represent in many form. For example, 0 0.01010001 into 2 to the power 5 by adding another 0 before 1. That we can do. And then it will uh, that 2 to the power 5. But this is not the case when we want to represent the number. We want to represent these number in normalized form where the where the most significant digit is generally a 1. Now it cannot, it may not happen in all the cases. We will talk about those cases and how to represent those cases in a slightly uh, later slides or so. But technically what we are trying to say here, okay, so sign which happens to be 0, fractional mantissa, fractional mantissa that means point will be assumed towards the left hand side, okay, so and this is going to be 0 0.101001 exponent happens to be the sign of exponent is 0 and magnitude of exponent is 100. Zero, zero. So this is the representation for the 10.25. 10 but is it the correct representation or still something more is to be done? Okay, so let's go to an actual hypothetical 16-bit representation and that particular representation will we will try to explain the philosophy behind this particular representation now there will be one or two more concepts which will be coming up and significant and mantissa are one, or one and the same thing but uh, what we are going to uh, add another concept or something called bias so let's look into the uh, representation now so the first thing is what we are saying is first we are representing the sign okay and sign is going to be attached to the significant or mantissa the second thing which we will do for this hypothetical representation we will represent exponent first and significant later now is there any reason associated with it well this there is a major reason associated with it is comparison of two numbers so we can just start from comparing the exponent and if there are uh, if an exponent is more than another exponent that number is definitely bigger than the second number you don't have to go to significant value and and then check exponent like that so that is why exponent is represented first 
Okay, and the leftmost bit is sine bit, which we have already stated of the mantissa. Mantissa or significance should be in normalized form. Why normalized form? Because the it represents the maximal representation, right? So that is why the maximum you can represent with the help of it. Otherwise, uh, and, and uh, we will talk about uh, truncation error also later on. But you will find if we don't represent this in the maximal form, you will have more truncation error. And the base of this number happens to be 2 and a value of 8. Now in this particular case, 8 is also slightly hypothetical because uh, we normally add 2 to the power n minus 1. Okay, so let's not uh, debate on that particular issue. But then a value of 8 is added. Why we have used it? Because this simplifies our arithmetic later on and we have added 8 is added to exponent. Now, this is called a bias. Why, why do we add, need to add exponent, uh, uh, some 8 into the exponent and why not into the significant? Well, what we remember from our previous presentation and uh, block, uh, unit, uh, the same unit, block uh, 1 unit 2, that in fixed point numbers, we represent fixed point negative numbers or in fact fixed point numbers with the help of sine 2's complement notation. So significant is definitely going to be in sine 2's complement notation. So why can't we do the similar thing to exponent? Well, once again, here lies the basic essence. Why we call, uh, why we need bias? Once again, the comparison. Comparison of two exponents is much easier when we are representing it with the help of a bias rather than the binary two's complement notation where you will find if it is uh, the magnitude if you just compare the magnitude of minus 127 yeah minus 126 with minus 127 you will find the magnitude just the magnitude not the representation wise just the magnitude if you compare then minus 126 magnitude will be higher right similarly minus 1 magnitude will seems to be higher so there will be different algorithm which you really need to represent uh, uh, to use for this particular case whereas in the case of bias it will be directly representable it will be easily uh, easily comparable uh, number in that particular case and there is another reason for this and that is something which we uh, we will do when we do actual number this is called subnormal numbers Okay, so right now in hypothetical 16-bit machine, we don't have any subnormal number. So that is why, let's not, uh, not to confuse you. So just, just the thing is here is that there has to be a comparison available to us. Now, that all the things which I have spoken so far are somewhat hypothetical. They look, uh, I mean, there had to be some examples for this particular representation. So let's look into uh, the representation first and then the example of this particular representation right so now what are the things which we are doing here a normal exponent of 4 bits normally can represent the exponent values between 0 and 15 right so you can represent the values between 0 and 15 so bias exponent changes that exponent range from because we have added 8 so if we have represented 0 as an exponent actually it is minus 8 Right? If our exponent is 7, 7 plus 8, 15. So basically, to, to when we I add 8 into it, it becomes 0. So the number range, the exponent range is going to be minus 8 to 7. Now, this is a very important concept. Once again, I am repeating this, that when I add bias, the, num, the, the, the range, right, 0 to 15, Start representing a range which I desire the number to represent, right? And over here it is minus 8 to 7 because the bias was 8, right? Suppose I have bias of 7 only, then the values would have been minus 7 to 8, right? So that is how this particular range or this particular exponent range is going to change in the binary uh, floating point representation. Second thing you have to see here is a normalized mantissa, the leftmost bit cannot be 0 in general. Therefore, it has to be 1 in this particular representation. However, when we move on to another representation, you can, you will find we, we can change this particular situation. Now, should we store this first bit or can it be assumed implicitly? Now, that's a question which we can answer. And many a times, since the first bit, we are assuming that it has to be 1. Suppose it is not 1, 
then probably that is not a number with the this particular representation. Okay, so if it is one, so we can assume it Im implicitly. Okay, so if we can assume it implicitly, so the first bit that means the remaining 11 bit. Okay, so we have 16 bit representation, one bit for sign, four bit for exponent. How many are remaining? 11 bit. So those 11 bit of Mantisa can actually represent 11 plus 1 implicit bit which happens to be 12 bit total Mantisa. So this we, get, we are getting one additional bit which is not bad, right? So uh, let's look into some examples and then uh, if there is a need we can discuss about that particular thing. Now a hypothetical 16 bit representation, okay? This particular thing has been, uh, once again, you can make equivalent binary representation. This is a table of 2 from starting from 2 to the power 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4, you can uh, have it over here. Then on the, on the decimal side, when you move towards the decimal side, 2 to the power minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, which happen to be the equivalent values has been put over there. So let's try to represent plus 10.25 which we have uh, represented earlier. So plus, okay, so the plus we have, uh, right now there is nothing called plus. Let's, uh, let's, yeah, something. Okay. So plus, okay, so what we have is zero. Okay. Zero, one, zero, one. Now, now I want to represent eight, right? So 2 to the power 3, 8, because I need to represent 10. So 8 plus 2, so this is 10. 0.25, there is a direct one over here. So this is 1010, right, which is represented in 1010.01. Now, if I want to convert it into the hypothetical 16-bit representation, how big, how big is my mantisa? 12-bit. Now, what should be the exponent? The, this whole number should be fraction. And the, the last, this first bit should be there. So I move 1, 2, 3 and 4. So my exponent happens to be 4, which happens to be 0, 1, 0, 0. However, this is not biased right now. Okay. My fractional mentesa so far is starting from 1, right? So 1 followed by 0 coming over here, 1, 0 and 0, 1. So this whole mentesa is over there now. Okay, now this one, the, which is shown in green, actually is not to be represented because it is now implicit as per our representation. So if it is implicit, it need not be represented. So my mantisa becomes 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 and this one is already assumed or it has to be there for my this particular number representation. So what I am left with, the bits we will be representing, but first let's look into the mantisa. Sorry, exponent. Let's look into the exponent. So what is the value of exponent? 4. What is our bias? 8, which is 1, 0, 0, 0. Now you can see the ease of computation. And we add 0, 1, 0, 0 into it. So what we get? 1, 1, 0, 0. This. So now effectively, now my mantisa from 4 has changed to 12, right? So now my mantisa, if you see, the number is 0 happens to be the sign. Okay, 1110 is the mantisa which happens, 1 here is the bias and 100 is the actual uh, the exponent but when while representing the number it has to be plus 12. Okay, so this is 12 only and the fractional uh, mantisa is going to be 1 happens to be the assumed bit or implicit bit. So we will have 11 other bits. So I already have 01001. 01001. Okay. Now, how many are we are left with? Six more bits. So they will be filled with zeros. And this is what is my floating point representation for 10.25. Let's take few more examples for this. Otherwise, uh, we might get confused in this particular situation. Now we take another example of plus 6.375. Now six is going to be four and two. Right, 4 and 2 and in over 2 to the power 0 is 0. Now 375 is less than 0 0.5, so it's 0 here. Okay, 0 0.375 is more than, uh, okay, is more than uh, 0.25, so there is going to be 
point uh, one, uh, 1 over here and we are still left with 1, 2, 5. So 1, 2, 5 is this. So there is another 1 over here. So the number which we get now, 1, 1, 0, point zero one one. Okay. And the this one is implicit. Okay. The first one is implicit. And the remaining 1, 0, 0, 1, 1 coming from this zone will be taken. What is the exponent value in this particular case? How many bits we have moved? 1, 2, and 3. So exponent happens to be 3, okay, which is 0, 1, 1. And what we do in this exponent? Add a bias. When we add a bias, we get 1, 0, 1, 1, right? So this is the number now, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. The 1, which is the implicit bit, 1, 0, 0, then 1, 1, and 6. Once again, least significant digits, which have to be there to complete the representation. And the final example, once again, let's look into another example. Now, this is slightly bigger, so you will uh, realize the reason. So, suppose I want to do it for 31.96875. So, 36, uh, 31 happens to be 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. And 0.96875, you keep on adding 0 0.5 plus 0.25, 1, 0 0.75, 0 0.125, 0 0.0625, 0 0.03125. So all becomes 1. Then this particular number will be, this is this, the whole sum is going to be equal to this particular number. So this is what is the representation for 31.96875. Now over here, how many, what is the exponent? 1 movement, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So exponent happens to be 5. Okay. And in the bias representation, it is 1, 1, 0, 1. Ment fractional mentis in this particular case, how many? 4, uh, 4 plus 4 plus 2, so 10, 10 bits, okay. So the 10 bit and one of them will is going to be, one of them is going to be uh, implicit. So this green is once again implicit and you can represent this particular number. This time, since 10, uh, 10 digits were already there, so you already, you just need two more, uh, that is padding of two bits, which is 0, 0. So this is the number. So this particular way, I can represent my number into the floating point number. But what I was talking about that we can, suppose I get an unnormalized number, then how the numbers are going to be represented? Well, to know that, let us try to see what is the minimum and maximum for this binary floating point number range. So to do that, we will do some calculations first and then find the minimum and maximum. Well, the smallest mentisa value, what should be the smallest mentisa value? First one is implicitly 1, okay, and we have assumed 0 0.1, so this is the number representation. But IEEE is slightly different, we'll, I'll explain those differences to you a little bit later. So this is 0 0.1 over here and followed by 11 zeros, okay, so this is implicit. And all mantissa bits are 0. So that is the minimum one, right? Which happens to be 1 into 2 to the power minus 1 because this is what this, this bit position is 2 to the power minus 1. So we are just talking about the mantissa. We are not talking about the exponent so far. So this happens to be 0.5. Okay. What is the maximum value for the mantissa? The implicit one bit followed by all ones, right? So we get this particular stuff. Okay. Now, to uh, know this particular value, we can simply do a little bit of uh, jugglery. We can add just 1 to it. Okay. And that actually is equal to 2 to the power minus 12 in this particular case because this is the 12th location. So this is 2 to the power minus 12. Okay. And the sum of this will become 1. So this is, this is equivalent to 1 minus 2 to the power minus 12. So this is how we have evaluated the values. Now let's look into the number range. What is the smallest negative number? Smallest negative number is going to be with maximum mantissa and maximum exponent. So this is going to be negative of 1 minus 2 to the power minus 12 into 2 to the power 7, roughly close in, in terms of decimal. Lowest negative number. Now this is very, very important. Maximum mantissa and minimum exponent, which happens to be 0.5 into 2 to the power minus 8. Smallest positive number, 0.5 into 2 to the power minus 8 
this is the smallest positive number and largest positive number is to, uh, into 2 to the power 7. Now look into these two numbers that is largest negative number and the smallest positive number. If I roughly calculate 2 to the power minus 8, in fact not roughly 2 to the power minus 8 is around 200 and 1 upon 256 and if I divide 0.5 by 2, 256 right it may somewhere will be 0 0.0002 right so somewhere this is decimal equivalent we are referring to so somewhere the decimal equivalent value minus 0 0.0002 and plus 0 0.002 there are nothing no number can be represented between the two you got my point between minus point 0 0.000 roughly 2 to point zero 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 two, okay zeros may be extra here and there you can calculate that but between the these two values there will be huge number of real numbers which go unrepresented by this particular format okay so this is the weakness of the representation which we have been using strictly strict if I am using strict normalization only, then there is a range of number which go unrepresented. And this particular thing was covered in IEEE standard by introducing subnormal numbers. So in between the two, there will be somewhere subnormal numbers and somewhere in between is going to be zero also. Okay. In fact, you will find there will be two representations of 0 in this particular representation okay uh, one will be positive 0 and one is going to be negative 0 as per the standard and definitely that is what is represented in IEEE format. So now let us look into another issue as far as floating night number is concerned. So it is about the precision of the number. Now precision is if I can roughly put it in words it is how precisely you can represent a number, right? How precisely I can or you can represent the number using this particular format. So now if I am talking about the precision, the precision of number will be higher with bigger mantissa. So the bigger is the mantissa, the more chances of representing closer number to actual. Okay, that let me show this particular thing with the help of an example. Now, the example, let's let's start with the example with some numbers. Suppose I want, suppose I have just two bit mentisa, one is assumed and another is the zero in this particular case. So this is two, so this is the smallest number it can represent. The next number it can represent, now they can be smaller than this, but I'm just taking, uh, exp I'm starting from exponent two, okay, and that is without bias. Exponent is without bias, just to, for the sake of demonstration. So if I start with that, so what I get, this is equivalent to number 2, 0.1 into 2 to the power 2 is 2. Then I multiply it with 2 to the power 2, what I get, 3, right, okay. So this is what you, you move, actually when you multiply it by 2 to the power 2, you actually move towards the right twice, so you get a number 3. Now you move 3 times, you get 4, but 0.11 and 2 to the power 3, it becomes 110, it is 6. That means I cannot represent 5 using this particular representation. Moving further, okay, 2 to the power 4. So 1, 2, 3 and 4, this is 8, right? Then 2 to the power 4, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, this is 12. So between 8 and 12, I cannot represent precisely 9, 10, 11 and 12 with this particular representation. Likewise, it will go on further and further, right? So this is the whole issue. The lesser are the number of bits, okay, lesser are the number of bits by which I am representing a number, yeah, the lesser is the precision of the number, we will be, will not be able to represent the numbers more accurately or several numbers will be, for example, 5 may be truncated to, to 4 only, okay, similarly 7 will be truncated to uh, 6 only and many more numbers will be truncated to 8, 9 and 10 probably, right? So this is the way, I mean, this is the problem of less number of bits 
uh, if we use less number of bits in binary floating point number and this is what has been pointed out here also you can uh, read this statement at your own convenience similarly the truncation error is suppose i am utilizing just two bits then 0.11 and 0.11 if i multiply them what will i get the answer will be 0 0.10 and that is going to be somewhere around 8 right so this actually has to be because 9 cannot be represented. We are, I am ignoring the uh, exponent in this particular case. So that's why that's why you are getting this kind of a situation. But what you are seeing that we will be losing a lot of valuable information when we are dealing with very small number of mentisa bits. Okay. So the larger mentisa bits are required. And on that basis, uh, IEEE designed several uh, representations okay and standards this is called single precision standard okay in single precision standard the total si uh, number total number size or the number can be represented using 32 bits okay in that 32 bits this out out of these 32 bits uh, around 8 are eight are used for representing the exponent and one is signed so you are left with uh, around uh, so one is sine eight is exponent so you are left with uh, twenty three bits. Now, interestingly, in this particular case, the highest exponent. Now, exponent is going to be biased, and that's what we will see slightly later. So, exponent is definitely going to be biased, but the highest exponent. So, if eight bit representation, our exponent can value can be zero to two fifty five. Now, two fifty five. If the value is the n is not equals to 0, then we say that it does not represent a number. Okay, because the highest, because we need some value to represent infinity, and that is represented by the highest number, which can be represented by a machine using single precision. Okay, single floating point. Uh, that is IEEE standard. So suppose you are representing uh, in C language, you are using float, then that is what you are going to get. Okay, so 255, okay, not equals to 0. And I suppose it is equals to 0, then it is minus or plus infinity depending on the sign bit. Okay, now moving on to if E is between, exponent is between 0 and 255, that means 1 to 254. So 1 to 254, how many values? 254 or 255 values. So exponent divided by 2, right? So divide 254 by 2, how much you get? 127. So that is what is going to be the bias in this particular case. Okay. So that is what you will find. So the number is going to be, now please note, over here they have changed it to 1.10. We were using one implicit bit in the decimal side in that 16 bit representation. IEEE typically says that number is going to be 1.n multiplied by 2 to the power exponent and minus 2 to 127. So accordingly when I am representing the number I have to make the adjustments into, into that particular form. Okay. Now suppose the number, suppose I get a number where n is 101, the remaining 20s are zeros and exponential happens to be 207. Then what is my actual number? My actual number, assuming that the sign is plus, it is going to be 1.101 because the mentisa which has been represented, right? n is the mentisa which has been represented. Okay, so 1 is the implicit one. So it is 1.201 multiplied by 2 to the power 207 was the actual this uh, actual uh, mentisa and what we have to reduce from it or what we have to remove from it is the bias okay when we were representing the number okay from uh, okay we'll take it other way down also so the bias is to be removed and what we will get plus 1.101 into 2 to the power 80 suppose suppose i get any number 0 0.1 Suppose I get to represent 0 0.1101 into 2 to the power 81, 
into I triple E number format. So how will I do uh, do the conversion? First, I'll convert it into this particular form. So it becomes 1.101 into 2 to the power 80. All right, and then my mentisa. What is going to be my mentisa? My mentisa is going to be 101 followed by 20 zeros because one is implicit, and my exponent is going to be 80 plus 127. 80 plus 127 will give me 207. So you can get both way how to convert the number, right? Now an interesting thing over here, suppose the exponent is 0, okay? Then we are getting the subnormal number which we I was talking about, okay? And the whole over here, n is not going to be normalized, right? n is not normalized in this particular case because the normal in the case of normalized number one has been already assumed okay or and the number has been represented so n need not be normalized and and, and our, even our representation you got when the actual value which we represented may start with zero because one was implicit in that particular case right so this is what you can see over here okay so what you can see very easily is 2 to the power minus 126 because of because we have moved it towards this particular side one bit so that is why we are we, we have enhanced our exponent value by one but on the other side what you see n n is now normal and minimum number is 23 uh, this 23 n's so i will be getting all zeros followed by one Okay, so now that is a subnormal uh, sub normal number. It is not a normal number, but it is in the range which I was talking about. Uh, minus smallest minimum number and smallest positive number between the two. Sorry, largest minimum number and smallest negative, uh, smallest positive number. Smallest positive number and largest negative number. Between the two, these subnormal numbers can be represented and finally the representation for zero what you can see plus minus zero depending on the sign bit so floating point numbers are not easy to understand but they are very interesting okay and uh, most of the time like if you get the feel of this okay you will be getting uh, uh, i mean many of you who are going to do uh, numerical methods or uh, numerical technique kind of a course Okay, that course also covers in detail, in-depth study about the floating point number. So you can also refer to that, those blocks and can study about this particular numbers. But these are very interesting set of numbers. The interesting part of these number is that number one, number one, mentesa and the sign, they are related. Number two, the number technically has to be normalized, but they can be helps in. Uh, not only representing the subnormal number, but bias also help in comparison of two numbers. Now, is the single precision number sufficient for floating point numbers? Well, no, there is double precision numbers. In fact, now quadruple precision format is also there and octa, uh, octal precision uh, formats are there. Uh, in general, if we compare a uh, typical uh, floating point number, of a single precision to a number of decimals it can represent correctly it is seven decimal to eight decimals only whereas uh, this uh, double precision number can represent around uh, 12 to 14 uh, decimal digits that you can calculate so octa octa precision number octagon that will uh, i mean uh, this quadruple will be another i mean uh, this is 64 bits that will be 128 bits and then there will be 256 bits of presentation. So the more is the size, the more is the precision, the more accurately we will be able, I mean, represent a particular number within a floating point number. So this was the first part of my presentation. So we have talked about the floating point number. Now in floating point number, what we have basically once again uh, tried to see, Floating point numbers basically are equivalent to real numbers. Okay, so they are somewhere down the line, somewhere equivalent to real numbers, and the real numbers then can be utilized. Uh, you can be represented in the form of some sort of exponent notation, 
from exponent notation then you move on to represent these particular numbers uh, from exponent notation in the form of mantissa and exponent. We represent exponent first because the exponent once suppose both the numbers are positive right the exponent value can easily determine right easily determine which number is greater or smaller. We don't need to go to go to the mantissa but if exponent is equal then only we need to go to mantissa. In case of positive numbers right and in case of negative and positive numbers well it's going to be slightly different so you got to study about this particular point i have already tried to explain you in some uh, basic sense and uh, uh, you will be able to correlate this whatever we have studied to what you study during the blog or extra uh, reading or wherever you want to study now from the floating point number let's move on to error detection and correction codes now these are another very interesting domain as far as computing science are concerned. Error detection and correction codes basically their purpose is recognition and correction of errors during data transmission. And why do we errors occur? There are some disturbances in transmission media or external environment that can cause and what kind of errors do occur? Basically, the, uh, the, what is the error? Error is 1 bit changes to 0 and 0 bit changes to 1. In fact, in networking, you will be studying about these uh, codes very, uh, I mean, uh, they, you will be studying. But what we will be studying, what you use in computer hardware, okay, many of you might have heard about term ECC RAMs, ECC uh, uh, error correcting and all those kinds of things. So what kind of technologies, these kinds of uh, uh, technology, uh, uh, what kind of concept these technologies use is going to be discussed here. Now, the very first thing which I'm going to discuss with you is the parity bit. Okay. Now, uh, now this is a very simple concept. You should uh, enjoy this particular concept. Okay. One of the simplest error detection code. And now, what we do in this? Add one bit to binary data to make the total number of ones in that data either odd or even. For example. If data is happens to be 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, let's count the number of ones, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So, right. So, we will add another bit as parity bit. If we want to add even parity bit, how many ones are already there? Four ones. So, the parity bit has to be 0 because we want to make the number of, uh, number of ones in this particular case as odd. And in this particular case, they are oh, sorry, even in even parity. So they are already even. So we just add zero. So in eight bit data, we had only uh, in com including the parity bit, we have everything as one. Now, if I want to do odd parity bit, there are four. So by adding one, I now I will have odd number of uh, ones in the data as well as parity bit. Okay. So this the parity bit value is going to be one. Similarly, another case where data is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. The parity bit for even parity, once again, how many bits? 1, 1, 1. So for even parity, we will add parity, parity bit as 1. So the data plus parity bit have, will have even number of 1s. And odd parity is, if I add 0, then odd parity is going to be served. But how does it detect error? Okay, so, so consider the following 4-bit data. 1010 use odd parity bit odd parity bit becomes 1 so the overall data is you add it here or before it's up to up to the system right we'll see where, uh, it, i mean normally it is the topmost bit when 8 bits are used 7 bits are used 8 bits is on to the leftmost side okay so if i say 0101 so odd parity is so my data becomes 11010 we transmit both data and odd parity bit to the receiver side and when it is received as suppose it is received as 10001 and obviously parity bit as uh, is not changed as one there is one bit is an error now please note these uh, the, uh, these bits are I mean these codes are very simple codes so normally they detect one uh, one uh, error in one bit only not too many bits suppose the two or three bits are in error then it may or may not detect it. In 2, it will not. In 3, it may. In 4, it may not. So like that, you can see. Okay. So odd parity at the destination will turn out to be 0. And the, the parity from the source which was transmitted, it has to be transmitted. So 0 and 1 are not same. So that is the flagging of error. 
So what we can say that there is an error in the data. So what is the error detection and correction? The objective of error basic error detection and correction is data should be transmitted between a source and destination pair. It has reliably indicating error or even correcting it if possible. Now, uh, the next thing uh, we, which we want to know is the process. So, process of error detection and correction, how it starts. So, this is the source end or the, on the source side. What we do, we uh, apply error detection function to data at the source. So, and then we generate data plus error detection and correction point bits. We combine them as data. Store data and error detection correction bit, uh, bits together at the source. Then, if data transmission requests transmit the store data as well as uh, error detection and code bits to the requisite destination. Okay, so at the destination, then we receive it data and this thing, uh, data and uh, error codes from the source. Then we apply on the data only, we apply the error detection and correction function once again to generate. Error and error detection and correction bit at the destination. Then we compare source and destination error code bits at the destination only. This is done at the destination only and then try to flag or correct an error. So, this is a simple process of error detection and correction. Uh, some of the commonly used error detection function, the parity bit which I just uh, spoke to uh, you about, and the second is Hemming error correction. Now, we will talk about Hemming error correction code a little bit more because this is one of the most important and uh, the way we are going to represent is once again a very, very practical way. Okay. So, please be very attentive after uh, the next slide. Okay. So, Hemming error correction code happens to be Richard Hemming and Bell Laboratory decide this. We will just introduce this by with the help of an, an example of 4-bit data. Let's assume Okay, let's assume a 4-bit data which happens to be D3, D3 like this and the basic idea is to divide these 4 bits into groups. So, what we are going to do, please, this is the most important part of this presentation now about the error detection. The basic idea is to divide these 4 bits into groups such that parity bits value of those groups help in identifying error bits uniquely. Now, what is the best way in binary system is the position system. So, if I say, okay, now this is important, this is the basis of grouping, okay. So, 2 to the power 0 is 1, 2 to the power 1 is 2, 2 to the power 2 is 4 and 2 to the power 3 is 8. Now, if I say this is my bit position 1, this is my bit position 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, this is my complete data which includes data as well as parity bits. That's what is the situation. So, suppose my data bit is at location 3, on which parity it can cause error? Parity 2 and parity 1. Okay. So, the positions which are very, very important for us, 1, 2, 4 and 8 and the remaining numbers are consisting of these values. Okay. Therefore, my parity bits are to decide, going to reside at position 1, 2, 4 and if needed 8. Okay. Where my data bits will start? Once parity bit. So, this is P1 and P2. So, P1 will reside at this position. P2 will reside at this position. My data bit, first data bit will be residing at position number 3. Parity bit third will be residing in position number 4, then data bit 2, data bit 3, data bit 4. Fortunately, we do not have any more data, so otherwise we would have what we what would have resided over P4 and then data 5, data 6 onwards we could have taken into consideration. Now, look into the, st st uh, the, the stuff here. So, D4, 7, 7 is 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1. So, if there is an error, right? In D4, it will contribute to P3, P2 and P1. All the three places, all the three bits it will, it is going to affect. So, I can recognize that. If it is 6, it is going to affect only P3 and P2, right? Not P1 because 4 plus 2. This is how we are designing. I am grouping them into them now. Okay. D2, D2 happens to be 5. So, first 
that is P2, P3 and P1, no P2 and D1 in the case of P2 and P1. Now, if any, now once again remember this particular thing, this particular code is when there is an error in only one bit of data or the code, any of them, only, so there are seven, total seven bits, okay, out of these seven bits, if any one of the bit is in error at the destination, we can rec recognize it, otherwise this particular scheme is not going to work, okay, if more than one bits are in error. So let's look into example of it now. So suppose my data which is 10 zero and 10, zero. so first thing is, my bit positions, once again, as we have done in the last slide, data bits happens to be 0, 1, 0, 1, okay, starting from lowest bit, 0, 1, 0, 1, at bit position 3, bit position 5, bit position 6, and bit position 7. Now, let's use these bit positions to, to generate the parity bit. So, what is the value of D4? D4 happens to be 1. So, it can contribute to P3, it can contribute to P2 and it can contribute to P1 at all the three places, one each. Okay, 6, D3 can contribute to P2, so 0 is there, D3 can contribute to P2, so there is a 0, right, so this is 0. What about P, uh, 5, so D2 can contribute at here, D2 can contribute here. Once again at 3 position it is 0, so the bit value is 0, it can contribute in P2 as well as P1 as we shown in the last slide. Okay, now what is the parity P1? 1, 2, so odd parity we are taking. How many ones? 2. So odd parity bit is going to be 1. So this P1 is going to be stored at, right, at this location. Okay, then P2, only 1, 1. So what is the value of uh, odd parity? 0, right? And what is the odd parity in this particular case? 1. Right? Because there are two ones. So, odd parity is one. So, my parity bit which is generated at the source is one, zero, one because of this particular data. And what is my data now? One, zero, one, the parity bit, the zero, this is data bit, the parity bit and the parity bit. So, this is my data plus parity which is to be transmitted at the destination. Let's look into the destination situation. So, I received the data. Suppose the data is received as 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. That means I, this particular 1 has actually changed. Instead of 0, it has been changed to 1. Rest all the data values and the parity bits are the same. Now, using the data that is this D4, D3, D2 and D1, let's generate the parity at the destination. D3, D2 and D1. So, once again, we map it. 1 maps to D3, D1, all the 3, 6, 0 maps to 0, that is this position and this position only, 5 maps to this position and this position only, and D1, which happens to be in error, maps to uh, this position as well as this position. Now, what are my parity bits now? 0 and 1. In this particular case, all the 3 bits are 1, so the parity bit is 0. In this case, Okay, the two, uh, two ones are there, so parity bit, to make it odd parity, it is one. Okay, and uh, the, for this, the, the parity bit, bit remains unchanged. So now what we see, this is the destination parity, and this is the source parity. There is a difference between these two and these two. So the, what is the difference? Both are same, so put a value zero. If both are different, put a value one. In both the cases, both are different, so we put a value one. What is the value of this? What is the decimal equivalent of it? 0, 1, 1. What is the decimal equivalent of it? 3. That means bit position 3 is an error. Change it to, because it was 1, change it to 0. I have made the correction. Now, I correct data has been received. 1, 0, 1, 0. Right? Slightly confused. So, let's take another example. Okay. Once again, the similar situation. A different example. So, pay attention once again. 1, 1, 0, 1, 0 and odd parity which we are using this time. So, our data is 1, 1, 1 and 0. Parity bits are at P1, P2 and P3. D4 will contribute to this, this and this. It is 1, so we are putting 1 all the places. 6, D3 will contribute to P3 and P2. So, both the cases since 6 is having 1, data value 1. So, 1 value is reflected at both the places. D2, once again 1, so both the places 1. 
D1 happens to be 0, so at both the places value 0. Alright. Alright. So odd parity in this particular case, 3, three ones, odd parity 0, 2 ones, odd parity 1. Uh, then we have 2 ones, so odd parity is 1. This is what my data. Now 1, 1, 1 comes from here. 0 is the parity bit. The data bit comes from here. 1, 1 comes from here. This becomes my data plus parity, which is to be transmitted. Now data and parity is transmitted. Unfortunately, this time error is introduced in the 6th bit position. Data is received as 1010, right? So is there any error? So D4 once again contributes to this. D3 contributes to D3 as well as D2. Now in this particular case it is 0. Now you look into the uh, D2. Once again you can see D1 and D2 same. But there is because of D3. Now you calculate the parity bit. This remains 1. This remains, this change to 0 because there is 1, 1, 1. So this has to be 0. There are 2 ones, so parity bit has to be 1. So there the parity, right? So change in data introduced, error in parity. I mean the parity bits are now 1, 0. So let's compare them. 1, 0 does not match. 1, 1, 0 does not match. So put a value 1. 1, 1 are the same, so put a value 0 here. So what is my parity which is generated? One the, the difference word which has been generated? 1, 1 and 0, which is equivalent to 6, right? 4 plus 2, right? So 6, 6 is basically which position? This position. Change this value to from 0, it was already 0, change it to 1. So I am not able to just identify the error, but correct it also. Now this is the beauty of this Hemings error correction code. This is error correction code. Parity was error detection only. But over here we are correcting the error also, but in single bit. Now there can be another situation where only the parity bit which is received is an error. And data there is no error. So let's take that example also. Okay, so data is represented with the help of 1000 and you can you can now calculate at least these parity bits at the destination. So what we find, luckily in this particular case, all the parity bit happens to be zeros. Okay, and at the destination, what we receive, let's say the fourth, which is the parity bit, D3 is an error. All the data and everything has been received correctly. So what we will find in the parity bit, source parity bit, uh, source parity bit and destination parity bit, there is a difference here. So our word, the difference word is 100. What is the equivalent value? 4, which happens to be this particular value which says that the parity bit is an error. Data is correct. Simply use it. There is no need to change anything. So this is the way we have not only recognized the error, but we are able to correct errors in case when we are dealing with Hemming error correction code. Okay, compare it with the, the correction code or the parity bit, simple single uh, parity bit, which was just an error detection code. So error detection in correction is a very important process and bit positions can help us a lot. And I think with this example, you can, uh, now you are in a position to check your progress. So I have already included check your progress. You can solve these uh, problems at your end and uh, try to send uh, answers to your friends groups also where they, they will be helping you in uh, uh, seeing whether the answers are correct or not. And questions, once again, please ask questions about this. You can send your questions to many places listed in the program guide. And uh, one of the places will be your coordinator place. So you can send your queries to your coordinator and they will be coming to the required person, going to the person who can answer those particular queries. Thank you for the time being. I hope you must have enjoyed the session. Bye for now.